just use the chat box. But for any questions, please try and use that Q&A function. It'll help us see it because there's a lot of people on today. So that chat box might get really full. Uh, Kevin, you ready? Yeah, thanks, Vanya. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm really excited about today's session. Uh, we, for many of you know this, we offered this webinar about a month or so ago with a partner uh, organization, Get Abstract, but we didn't have enough seats. They didn't really have enough seats in the platform. So I got crushed with like, hey, I tried to sign up and it was already full. So we rescheduled this and uh, made sure we had a thousand seats and we're full again. So this is crazy, uh, but crazy in a good way. And I don't know, it's, it's, I love doing this topic. It's my most popular topic. It's Friday afternoon where I'm sitting. I'm sitting here in Philadelphia. It's a beautiful day going in the weekend. And I just want to make sure that you guys, uh, you guys can hear me and see me okay. So in that chat window, just tell me, you know, where are you watching from? Where's your hometown? Uh, where's your city? I'd love to see, you know, who we're connected with and, uh, and, and go from there. I see Wheaton, Illinois and Cambridge. Ugh, it's, a, it's evening time in, uh, in Cambridge. It's hard to keep up. Connecticut, Massachusetts, Atlanta. Hey, a local Bucks County, Chicago, Berlin, another evening time. This is awesome. We definitely have a worldwide audience. And normally we hold these a little earlier in the day for, in the United States. There's a long story why we're a little bit later. But uh, thanks, Europe, and, and even later folks for joining us. New Zealand, I just love it. So, Officially, this is called seven things ultra productive people do differently. If I really wanted to lay on the benefits, I would have said this is going to be how you double your productivity or how you can get an extra hour of free time every single day. And I don't always lead with that because people don't think it's possible. You know, they just think that's overselling. But we're going to get to that in just a minute. You know, Vanya mentioned sort of the official me. You know, I'm an author, New York Times bestselling author, write for Forbes. Sometimes maybe I've met some of you doing, uh, doing talks. Uh, in the middle here, I'm looking so serious, making a point on TV. I host the daily LeadX leadership show. And of course, my day job, <laughs> I don't normally do webinars or all those other things. The day job is, you know, I'm the founder and CEO of LeadX. That's at leadx.org. Our mission is really to democratize leadership. And I have a broad definition of leadership. Like I want you to be a leader of people, but this day and age, leaders need to get stuff done, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. How do we be so productive, most productive, even with the limited time uh, that we have? Um, that's not me in this uh, screen grab. This is actually showing every day we do a free course of the day at leadx.org so that everybody around the world regardless of your means. If you've got internet connection, you can get a leadership course, a productivity course on your phone, on your tablet, or on your computer. But what about the unofficial meme? I just started doing this. It's been kind of fun. What would you find on my Instagram feed from, you know, the most recent few pictures? That's sort of the, the non-work me. And uh, this is my cat, Oscar, for example. And don't let him trick you. He looks really cute, but he's a jerk. Like, he's usually up on my chair and he's always crashing into the webinars and everything. So he, he's, a, he's a handful. Uh, I'm a single dad with three kids. First of all, I always drop in single dad first for the sympathy. I know I can feel it through the airwaves. Um, but also to make the point, like when I talk about being extremely productive, like when I get interviewed, people say, is this the most uh, productive man on the planet? It's because I'm a single dad, I'm doing the lunches and the dinners and the, the studying and all those kinds of normal parent things while I'm writing a book a year, running a startup, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this is my middle daughter, Natalie. We're searching for colleges right now. She's a senior in high school. This is Fordham in, uh, in the Bronx. I think I saw some New York uh, City folks uh, weighing in. I don't know if we got any Fordham uh, alum. I'm with my other two kids in this other Instagram post. We're at the Franklin Institute, nice museum day. This is actually um, a picture out of my, uh, where, where I live in Philadelphia. I live on the 53rd floor uh, in, uh, in Philadelphia. So you get some good sunsets and, and uh, cityscapes. And I only own two pieces of art, I only bought two pieces of art in my whole life. And this is one of them uh, from Peter Tunney. I'm a nut about gratitude. Every morning, I sort of start my morning with a gratitude practice. I think of like three things I'm grateful for and really feel it. And uh, this artist, it's, um, it's spelled funny because he, he talks about having an attitude of gratitude. 
And my kids mock me because I say that so much. Well, dad, you got to have an attitude of gratitude. So, um, you know, when your own kids are teasing you that you're, you're doing something right. Anyway, let's dive in. And the first message is, listen, remember what you signed up for here. I'm sharing with you just as the messenger, unusual, even weird, even controversial things that ultra productive people are doing. That's different than mere mortals. You know, by definition, you can't just do the normal average things if you want super results, extraordinary results. By definition, you got to do something different. So keep that in mind. And just to give you hope and encouragement, every day, it's awesome. My email inbox, strangers, you know, contact me and say things like, Kevin, thank you. You've doubled my productivity. You've made a huge difference to my productivity. You've changed my life from, uh, I guess this was on uh, Twitter or Snapchat. And so keep that in mind. Now let's dive in. Now I'm going to, we're not going to do official polls, but this is where you can type in just to the comments. So I'm curious, on average, how many hours do you work each week right now? And you could either type the number of hours in or A, B, C, or D. You know, are you working less than 40, 40 or 50, 50 to 60, or more than 60 hours? And I'm going to take a sip of water and I'm seeing all these answers come flying in. And I'm seeing mainly Bs, 40 to 50. Ooh, two jobs, 50 hours, 45 to 55. Yeah, with travel time, I bet most of you would add on another couple hours uh, a day. D, we got a super worker there, um, which I can certainly relate to. And here we go. If I had been able to tally all those up, it would look something like this. This is from another poll that I did. Most people are in this 40 to 50 range. We kind of saw all those Bs flying through on the comments. And then we've got another 17%, 50 to 60, 17%, 60 to 70. And here's the thing. There was a time when I was in my early 20s. I like to say I was young and dumb. Not that everybody in their 20s is, but I was. And I was doing my first couple of startups. And I thought you could hustle your way to success. There's nothing wrong with hard work. I, I believe in the hustle. There's no shortcuts. But, you know, five days a week wasn't enough. So, I was working seven. Eight hours a day wasn't enough. I'd work 16, sometimes more. Sometimes I would not go to sleep. The first year of my startup, I was so broke. I was literally living in my office. I would sleep under my desk, get up at five or 5.30, drive to the YMCA where I'd take a shower, go back to the office. I'd work till midnight, sleep under my desk. And I did that for 365 straight days. Worked on Christmas, worked on birthdays, all that stuff, and promptly went out of business. You know, I just tried to work more and more. And it was to the point where not only was I working those hours, but I was skipping meals. Uh, you know, I, I was just rushing and the stress, as you can imagine, was absolutely crazy. And my breaking point came with this police car. Not this specific police car, but a state police New Jersey trooper that looked just like this. And the story is, for those of you who've read my book, you already know this, you know, it was about 5, 5.30 in the morning. I'm driving to, uh, to, to work at that point. It was like my second company. And all of a sudden, I see lights in the rearview mirror. Oh, I'm getting pulled over. So, I pull off the side of the road, Route 1, for those of you who know the area. The state trooper comes over and he says, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, oh, sorry, officer. I guess I was speeding. And he looks down, brim of his hat's like, in my window. He says, speeding. He said, I was doing 55 miles an hour in the slow lane. You came up on my bumper, rode my bumper, then swerved left into the fast lane and took off right past me. And here's the thing. I never even saw this cop car. I never saw it. Not until the lights were in my rear view mirror. A well-marked state trooper is in front of me. I pull up to his bumper, ride the bumper, swing around him and take off. I don't even remember seeing him. I was so exhausted, so not present, not in my mind, thinking about all the work I had to do, thinking about how I had to get into work, that I, I literally wasn't even aware of my surroundings. I mean, that's how, how bad it was. Now, I should have known. The week before that, 5.30 in the morning, stopping to get gas at the gas station, get in my car to, to, uh, to leave, start to drive away, clunk. I had forgotten to take the nozzle out of my car. It just like ripped out of my car. Could have blown the place up. 
the week before that, now this is one, <laughs> usually people are, are horrified at my stories at this point. The one they chuckle at is, you know, part of my routine, I, I used to never eat breakfast. That's a mistake. You want to get some glucose into your brain, you know, but back then I thought I'm saving calories. I'm saving time. I'll just stop at the 7-Eleven. It was actually a Wawa for those of you in the Northeast that are in the know, but it's like a 7-Eleven, a quick mart, grab a cup of coffee and I would drink it on the way to work. That's what I did every day. But one of those days I'm sitting in the office, drink the end of my coffee. And I'm like, huh, I never stopped to pay for this cup of coffee. I had walked in, poured the cup of coffee, walked out, got in my car and just drove to work. I didn't pay for it. So I paid for two cups of coffee the next day. So this was how out of it I was in terms of hours and out of balance. This was my breaking point. And at that time, I was working about 100 hours a week and my little business was doing about a million dollars a year, just a handful of employees. And I ended up selling that business after about five years. And I realized that the most successful people I knew, the self-made millionaires, the high-level executives, you know, they weren't working 100 hours a week. They weren't jogging down the hall from meeting to meeting the way I was. They were talking to people. They even had time to jog, get ready for a marathon, play golf on the weekend. Like, who were these people? Like, how were they able to figure this out? So I started to ask them. I just became fascinated with productivity. And I learned and I got better. And then later, I started, so I sold that business and I started another one. Same industry, same exact type of business. And in five years, instead of having a million dollars, I grew it to $12 million, so 12 times better results. But at the time, instead of working 100 hours a week, I got down to where I was working 32 hours a week. I would try to take Fridays off, three-day weekends. So when I talk about you can double your productivity, and I bet your first reaction is like, oh, yeah, right, like that's all hype. Well, I did a 12 times result in one-third of the time. That's like 36x of my productivity. So I've, I lived this. I was horrible. The cop car pulled me over and I never saw him to where I was able to get 36 times more productivity and get like a three-day weekend all of the time. And when I sold that last company, I thought, okay, look, I had taken all those time management courses. I knew about getting things done. I had a great to-do list. I had all that training and it wasn't working because people are always like, why do we need another time management book? The stuff I read and was doing wasn't working. But rather than this being just about my own ideas, I said, all right, let me go out and let me interview seven self-made billionaires, Olympic athletes, straight A Ivy League students, and over 200 successful entrepreneurs. And I just asked them uh, a simple open-ended question. Give me your number one secret to time management or productivity. And I got all their answers and then looked for patterns. They weren't all doing the same thing, but I looked for what came up the most often and came up with the the 15 secrets, which became, uh, which became my uh, book. So <clears throat> that's where this knowledge comes from. And today in an hour, it's not even enough. I'm going to touch on like seven big ones. I can't get through all 15, but I'll also tell you where you can go to get, you know, more information on, on all of them. So let's dive in. All right. Secret number one, focus on one thing specifically Know and write down your daily most important task, your MIT. Now, this came up over and over again. Um, <laughs> for you, any City Slicker fans out there, what's your one thing? Um, Tom Ziegler, when I interviewed him, he's the son of legendary Zig Ziegler. You know, come on, Tom, give me your number one best secret. It says, invest the first part of your day working on your number one priority that will help you to build your business. And if you're not an entrepreneur, not a consultant, you know, what's the number one thing that will help you succeed in your role, in your career? And I heard this over and over, even, and now I've got ears for it. Just a couple months ago, I was talking to Dan Pink, the, the author of Drive, Whole New Mind, all that stuff, to sell as human, great guy, very successful. And I didn't prime, I was interviewing just about his new book and about sales. And I said, hey, Dan, before we leave, give me just, an actionable tip. What's going to, what can I share with everybody? And he said that what he does every morning, he goes into his office and he writes on his whiteboard, his number one, most important task. Damn it. That's, that's his advice. I hear it over and over again. Now I ran a study as a follow-up uh, for over 4,000 working professionals. And I said a bunch of questions, but one of them was, do you have a daily written MIT or not? Those who had an MIT 
not only are they more productive, they scored higher on happiness and energy. I think it's because they they know they're making progress on their most important thing and they're feeling more in balance. I don't exactly know where why this correlates to energy, maybe because they're doing other things right as well. You know, I, correlation doesn't always mean causation. Um, but, you know, there's something to this even beyond productivity. You know, what is your, people then say, well, how do I know what my most important task is each day? The idea is it's not, see, this is again, like it's not eat the frog first. It's not like, what's the thing you're putting off? What's the thing you hate on your to-do list? That's your MIT. No, don't eat the frog first. That's the Brian Tracy, you know, bestseller and wisdom. What you want to do is be very clear. It's kind of like I talk about tipping over the first domino. You know, what is your big, hairy, audacious goal? A BHAG, that comes from Jim Collins' work. And, you know, it might be like your big five-year goal or maybe even your one-year goal. But, like, you break it down. Like, what is an enabling goal to reach your BHAG? Break it down further. What's the enabling goal of that? And then what is the domino that you can push over today to make progress? So, just I'm making up silly examples. Maybe you're a small business owner and, um, you know, you want to double your sales. You want to double revenue. Well, and you've thought about, well, the first goal I have is I need a new vice president of sales who's going to drive more revenue. I need a, a really great VP of sales. Okay, well, what can you do? What do you need to do to find a great VP of sales? Maybe in your case, you're like, I want to hire an executive recruiter. So now the enabling goal is find a recruiter who will find me a VP of sales who's going to increase my sales. Well, okay, I don't have a recruiter today. What can I do today to get closer to that domino? I can email my friends. Hey, does anybody got a good executive recruiter? I could spend 15 minutes doing a Google search. I can call an, uh, uh, an executive recruiter. And your MIT is going to change. It's supposed to change. Maybe I've already got that recruiter. It's a month from now. And my number one task for the day for my BHAG is like review these resumes that were sent to me by the executive recruiter or do the interviews or write up the job offer. You know, maybe you've always wanted, let's do a personal example. Maybe you've always wanted to write that great novel. You want to write a book. And um, as an author, you got to think twice about that one. I, I, I don't like writing. I like having written, past tense. But anyway, so let's say, you know, you're going to write a great best-selling novel. Well, okay, you want to, you have to write it. And to write, you know, 50,000 word novel, you need to come up with, you know, 50 chapters and each chapter is whatever. And so today you could write 500 words or maybe before you write it, you want to find an agent, whatever it is, but you take the big goal and just work it down into what can you do towards it today. Now there's going to be a big second part to this. So here's another question. Again, we won't do a poll. You can just type it into the, uh, to the chat box. When is your energy and focus the highest throughout the day. When do you feel like, oh yeah, I'm sharp, I got it together, I'm creative. 8 to 10 a.m., 10 to 12 noon, eh, around lunchtime, 12 to 2, middle of the afternoon, 2 to 4, or late afternoon, 4 to 6. And I'm looking, there's a lot of A's. Ooh, I love it. Someone knows 5 a.m. to 8.30. They are very self-aware about that, which is cool. A lot of A's before A, actually. Another high achiever there, you can tell. 10 to 2, middle of the day. So, if we tallied all of these up, it would probably look something like this, because this is an actual chart from a survey I've done. Most people report 8 to 10 a.m., followed by 10 a.m. to noon. Very few people say they're at their best in the afternoon. And most, you know, other, other bodies of research suggest that this is true, that, um, usually we wake up and it takes us about a half hour or so to kind of fully awaken. And then from there, we have one to two hours where we are cognitively at our best. Our decision-making is at its best. Our ideation and creativity is at its best. Our ability to understand reason and process is at its best. Now, this is Dan Ariely, uh, a behavioral psychologist from Duke University. And he said in this Reddit, uh, ask me anything, you know, people are most productive in the first two hours of the morning after they're fully awake. And then he went on to say, and the dang shame is, how do most of us average people spend those first two hours? So you've got your cup of coffee, you arrive in the office. What are you doing really those first two hours? Feel free to type it if you want. Traveling, I like that. Um, 
a lot of us, it's we fire up, we open up, yeah, there it is, emails, walking around, talking to coworkers, email, email, emails, look at all these emails. Or it's, let me get the quick wins. Let me sign some expense reports. Let me, you know, do this one thing. We spend all this morning time on things that we could do just as easily in the afternoon. So the big takeaway, we're still on the first secret, is to time block your daily most important task. You know, this is a snapshot of a calendar and this highly productive person is actually allocating two hours a day. I, I'm going to have to change this slide eventually because it, that's actually very ambitious. It is a win if you can get 30 minutes a day on your MIT. An hour is amazing. If you need to start with 15 minutes, start with 15 minutes. It's knowing what is my most important task and then schedule it in your prime thinking time, usually between 8 and 10 in the morning. And as early in the day as possible, before all those emergencies happen, before everybody else starts bombarding you with the old, got a minute? And you know they lie, it's never just a minute, right? So you wanna put it on your counter. This is sacred time. If you have an assistant, you tell the assistant, hey, I'm gonna be here, the door is closed. Don't knock, don't buzz me, my email window's gonna be shut down, and that's your sacred time to advance on your MIT. That's the number one thing I heard. All right. Now, don't forget, you can type your questions in at, uh, at any time. And I'm going to answer one right now, as a matter of fact. Kurt Green, because it's right about this morning MIT. Kurt, you, you're asking, does it have to be every morning? Okay to identify the MITs for each day of the week in advance. Um, I would say, and it's really for all of this, what works for you works for you, and I encourage you to experiment. So, most of the people I talked to talked about a daily MIT. Most of the people I talked to, they even did it on their weekends. So like even if the MIT was like get to my kid's soccer game or date night on Saturday night, they kind of knew what their number one thing was that they were going to protect. And I think you can absolutely pre-schedule your MITs uh, and then just give yourself permission to change them. You know, for myself, when I was on this last book deadline and it went bad, I mean, I'm the productivity guy, right? And I got behind schedule. Well, I was blocking out like a three hour morning block just to write. And it was like, write, 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 write. Like for days and days, it was just writing. But then other times, like I just submitted my first draft. Now every day is different because I'm moving on different, different kinds of projects. So as far ahead as you can plan them, I think that's fine. Just give yourself that that wiggle room. All right, so secret number two. Hey, I, I warned you this was gonna get crazy. Don't use a to-do list. What am I talking about? All right, when I was about halfway done with my interviews, remember, give me your number one secret of productivity. I assumed everyone would be talking about a to-do list, right? You know, it's the getting things done method. You put on your calendar, your phone calls and your meetings, then you've got your to-do list and you review it and everything's like an A priority or a B priority. And then you got A1, A2, A3, right? Nobody mentioned a to-do list. So then I started asking, well, how come you're not talking about your to-do list or what do you do with your to-do list? And they're like, I don't use a to-do list, huh? So I, I dove into it. it. Turns out, at least the origin story of the to-do list is that it was invented by this guy, Ivy Lee. The year was 1918 and Charles Schwab was running U.S. Steel at the time. He says, I want my executives to be more, more productive. And this consultant, Ivy Lee, shows up and says, all right, I'm going to blow your mind with this idea. All you executives, what you're going to do is have a little piece of paper and you're going to write down three things that you need to do in order and stick it in your pocket. When you get to work, work on number one and keep working on it till it's done. Then you're going to cross it off and work on number two and keep working like that until it's five o'clock. Then you go home and you do it again the next day. Now, apparently this was a revolutionary idea. Everybody loved it. He made a lot of money, but there's some problems here. First of all, it ain't 1918 anymore. It's 99 years later. You know, I'm just telling you 1918, if you didn't know before internet, before globalization, before, you know, we all have to do twice the work without the staff, right? Very different times here. And besides, take a look at Ivy Lee. Does it look like he's having any fun? Do you want your time management advice coming from him? <laughs> I tease. When I look at the research more, I find this study that shows that 41% of the things that we put on our to-do lists are never done. 
to-do lists become the graveyard of important but not urgent. We do the urgent things. We do the quick things. We do the things that it feels so good to put that line through it, right? Sometimes I'll do something. This is the old me. I would do something like, hey, it wasn't on the list. So I would write it on the list and then cross it off because I wanted that stack of productivity that was just meaningless things on my to-do list. 41% of tasks are never done. Um, the other problem with a to-do list is called the Zygarnik effect after a psychologist that studied this. So she said that we feel this psychological dissonance, this stress, if we don't have a plan or finish what we start. And a to-do list is like, oh, I, I got all these things I've got to do. I used to have a yellow legal pad with two columns. Cross one off and write one in the margin, right? Never, it was always there. And so we go home exhausted. We've worked so hard. Oh my gosh, can't wait to go to sleep. And then bing, we're, we're wide awake with insomnia. Why? Zygarnik effect. Like we're stressing about it. We're thinking about it. It's probably why I blew past that cop. I was the Zygarnik effect, you know, in my head. So to-do lists lead to stress. They're not a great way of getting everything done. 41% failure rate. It's a tool that was done a long time ago. So what the heck are people doing instead? Well, what they're doing instead <clears throat> is they're living from their calendar. It's called schedule, don't list. If you really want to do something, if you really want to do anything, then pick a day, pick a time, pick a duration, and put it on your calendar. So the wisdom of getting things done, GTD, which is a classic, the most popular time management system out there, I didn't see anyone doing that. You know, that's like put your calls and appointments. The people I talked to, everything went there. Jordan Harbinger, CEO of The Art of Charm, schedule your day into 15-minute blocks. Sounds like a pain. This will set you up in the 95th percentile. CEO Dave Kirpin, I schedule out every 15 minutes of every day to conduct meetings, review materials, write, and do anything I need to get done. The people I interviewed literally time blocked. This is the time I'm going to check email. This is the time I'm going to go to lunch. This is the time I'm going to go to gym. This is the time I'm going to go on date night. And I know it sounds horrible to have to schedule date night, but they are doing more of their date nights than you probably are. <laughs> schedule everything and live from that list. Uh, Shannon Miller, many of us will remember, you know, gold medal Shannon Miller. I keep a schedule that's minute to minute. Now, listen, I, I get attacked on this. You know, I'm just the messenger. I get attacked on this. Some of you might be, <laughs> I'm laughing, Tyler, what's a date night? Um, great comment. So here's the thing. I'm not anti-list. Yes, I keep a grocery list. Yes, I have like, um, well, I don't really have a bucket list. I used to, um, but like, Lists are fine, different kind of lists, but not a to-do list that you're living from day to day, that you're working from day to day. These are just different tools for different levels of productivity. So memory, look, if, you've, if I've only got seven items, give or take two, that I need to get done today, I could probably remember them. You know, there's a little bit of chance I might forget one or two, but I don't need any tool. I'm just gonna be like, oh yeah, those are five things I need to get done today. You go beyond seven, and let's say you're up to about a dozen. This is where Ivy Lee makes sense. You know, I'm gonna take a little piece of paper. I'm gonna write the 10 things I need to get done and I'll keep it and I'll look at it and I'll cross it off, all that kind of stuff. But for most of us, now we're talking about ultra productive people, extreme productivity, self-made billionaires, self-made millionaires, successful entrepreneurs. They've got so many things that they're juggling that they can't just have a list of 10 items and cross them off. So they move to a calendar and the, another side benefit of the calendar, you will say no so much more effectively. When I used to work from a, a to-do list, if so, you know, I, I would say yes to anything. Hey, Kevin, can we have a cup of coffee uh, five weeks from now? Well, I look at my calendar. Oh, sure, that week's wide open. Yeah, we'll do that cup of coffee. Have you ever had a week where you had nothing going on? <laughs> when five weeks shows up, I'm going to be just as busy that week as I was this week. And this week, I didn't have time for coffee. So we get ourselves into these traps. We volunteer for nonprofit things, the church, the little league, the soccer, the parties, the cup of coffee meetings, you know, whatever it is, all good causes. When you lift from your calendar, you say, oh, well, you want to have a cup of coffee? Let me see where I can slot you in. It's yes. And can you do it? 18 weeks from now at seven in the morning, you know, so it's, you just become much more realistic about things. Sounds crazy. Jamie Kaepner, I don't know who she is. I think this was a tweet. Uh, thank you, Kevin Cruz, for helping me get out of the old mindset of to-do list. The paradigm shift has changed my life. Now, if you go to this method, 
like this is a snapshot of an old calendar of mine. Now, don't worry about what the items actually are right now. The point is when you start to live from your calendar, there is no white space, right? So right now you might have a little bit of white space on your calendar. There's no white space. And you, t you then, like in my case, now I just use Google Calendar, nothing fancy. You could use your Outlook Calendar. There's no special app for this. Um, I use uh, uh, a personal calendar and a work calendar. To me, life is just life. And that's what I heard from all these people I interviewed. But the, the personal calendar, I can just make private so work people don't see it. And, and uh, the, the family members can have access to the personal calendar and they don't care about the work stuff. But it's just one thing. You're, you're really uh, scheduling every, almost every minute of your day. All right, time for another question. What most interferes with your productivity? Like you, your, your best laid plans for a productive day, then you get into work and then what happens that gets in the way? And while you're thinking about that, I'm gonna have more water. And I see I'm already running uh, down on time. We can't have that happen on this time management thing. People stopping by, interruptions, people, 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 email, email, walk-ups, right? Other people. So this is what I hear over and over again. Email and got a minute meetings, interruptions are always almost tied for the, the, the two big problem areas. So we're gonna tackle these really quickly here. Secret number three to ultra productivity, minimize your meetings. Now imagine this, you get a hold of Mark Cuban, right? Mark Cuban, self-made billionaire, invested in a bazillion tech companies, owns a basketball team, he's on Shark Tank, like a million things going on. Mark, give me your number one secret to productivity. Wouldn't that be cool to ask him? I asked him. So typical Mark Cuban fashion, here's his answer. Never take meetings unless someone's writing you a check, <laughs> right? Kind of funny, snarky. Now, your first reaction is probably like, well, I'm not a billionaire. I don't have a staff of a million people like Mark Cuban. We can't, I can't tell my boss I'm not going to go meet with her. I agreed, but that's not the point. Mark Cuban could have answered anything. Mark Cuban, give me your number one secret of productivity. And it was about meetings. It was about the danger of meetings. Let's look at another one. Self-made billionaire Nate Blacharzik, co-founder of Airbnb. It's harder to get focused after having been bombarded by meetings. So I try to save meetings for later in the day. Co-founder of Facebook, Dustin Moskovitz. We have no meeting Wednesdays. He could have answered anything. Meetings are death. So this third secret is about how can you minimize them? How can you say, say no when you can? And if you can't say no, how can you minimize them? I asked Rory Vaden, great CEO, guru of time management. And, you know, I said, hey, Rory, what do you think about this idea of like one day a week where there's just no meetings, your company or your team bans meetings? And he laughed. He says, we only hold meetings on Mondays. It's called like uh, Mad Meeting Mondays, I think they call it. And, you know, that's just they stack all their meetings on one day so that the rest of the, the days, those are maker days, focus days, client days. And, you know, with all of these people, I'm sure there's exceptions. You know, it's not like you're going to get, you know, arrested if you break the no meeting rule, but it's a cultural system. So if you can't just say no, like Mark Cuban, first of all, say no whenever you can. But if you can't say no, can you say no on certain days of the week, like no meeting Mondays or no meeting Wednesdays, no meeting Fridays, or even have an understanding like, hey, you know what, guys? Let's do this. On our team, at least, we're in a big company, we can't control the whole company, but on our team, for our team meetings, let's try to schedule them in the afternoon so it protects our thinking time from 8 to 10, 10 to 12. You know, if we have to meet at 10 in the morning, fine, but let's look first in the afternoon. It's a very simple thing to do. The great Richard Branson, it's very rare that a meeting on a single topic should need to last more than five or 10 minutes. So shorten your meetings, 10 minute meetings. Um, I call this the Google clock. Now officially, if you wanna go buy one of these off Amazon, it's called the time timer. This is a clock that teachers use in their classrooms and it, it spins down so they could set it for 55 minutes and it spins down this red dial. And the story is that this Google engineer went in to like watch his kid in kindergarten or first grade, saw the teacher using this clock and like the kids would suddenly behave and focus and everybody could watch the red dial and know how long reading circle was or something. It worked so well, the engineer took the clock back to Google 
And now it, they use them in their design meetings and they're, they're in their conference rooms to keep meetings on track. All of a sudden, when your team knows this is a 30 minute meeting and they can see there's five minutes left, they're a little less likely to be like, and what about this other issue? And I wanna talk about this side topic and all the rest. It keeps you focused, that's the Google clock. Now the second big thing you guys said, and yeah, I know I'm moving fast, um, inbox zero. I get hundreds of emails a day, like legit ones, not spam. And most days I can get down to, inbox zero refers to getting down to zero emails in my inbox by the end of the day. Pretty crazy, right? So the data looks like this, and you said it in your comments, you know, on average, we're getting 122 emails per day. We spend 2.6 hours a day on emails. And it's horrible. We get email notifications every five minutes. And it's to the point now where we look at the incoming email within six seconds. That's less time than it takes for us to pick up the phone. We answer an email faster than someone that's, you know, calling us on the phone. And not only are we being interrupted by just, and it's taking up 2.6 hours a day, but email recovery time. So if I'm trying to work on this report, I'm trying to work on this paper, I'm trying to read, whatever it is, deep work, critical work, my MIT, and I go over to check that inbound email, I have to recover and get back into the zone, get back into the flow. Now research is all over from it takes us 64 seconds to 15 minutes to get back into the zone. Either way, not a good thing. So here's another question for you. Now this one you don't have to answer. I'm afraid of your answers in the comment window. What do these have in common? This is, this is a rhetorical question. Sex, drugs, gambling, and email. And I have a feeling some of you just started taking notes, right? Now you think this is gonna get good. <laughs> All right, what is it? We, I, see, I see people answering any of the top left one. Time, addiction. Dopamine. So dopamine is the hormone in our brain. It's a chemical in our brain. It's called the love drug. That's the reward and pleasure drug. So we've been developed, you know, evolutionary, biologically speaking, where we get dopamine hits when uh, for doing things that uh, will help the species, whether that's sex or eating high calorie food, right? We get these dopamine hits. And dopamine is linked to addictive behaviors. People talk about email and it's really social media now, right? So anytime we get that Facebook buzz, that Instagram buzz, that email goes off, we, it, it calls to us and we get a dopamine hit checking on it. You know, they say it's like, um, it, it, checking email is like pulling that slot machine handle. You don't know what it's gonna be. Like, am I gonna, am I gonna get, you know, three cherries and win a bunch of money or is it gonna be nothing? And most of the time is nothing. And that's what makes it fun. Maybe this is the big win. Maybe this is the big win. And with email, usually it's like boring, irrelevant, spam. But every now and then it's, you know, a funny joke or my boss just asked me a question I can answer and I feel good helping out my boss. So the first step with this email problem is you need to own, yeah, I'm wagging my finger at you. You need to own a little bit of this problem. Like what is your role in this problem? If you want to immediately get more productive, this will take you, don't do it now, wait till after the webinar. You'll do this in less than a minute. Turn off all your email notifications. When your email arrives, it shouldn't ring, it shouldn't buzz, it shouldn't pop open that little window, turn it off. Get rid of all those uh, interruptions on your games, on your Facebook. You know, there, there's a reason, ever wonder why you can't call Facebook for tech support? Like, I'm having problems with my privacy settings, let me call Facebook and ask them. They don't, there's no customer support number for us to call because we're not the customer. We're the product. Their advertisers are their customers. You know, they need us to pick up our phone and look at it in order for them to sell advertising, right? So don't be Pavlov's dog where, like, I love my phone. Trust me, I love my phone. But I pick it up when I want to pick it up, not when someone rings a bell from Facebook or from, you know, someone on the other end of an email. You know, people emailing you, that's putting their agenda onto your day. That's not your agenda. So that's a real simple thing is turn off all email notifications. Second one, you'll thank me later, unroll.me. Scribble that down or, hey, take your phone out. I know I just told you to put it away. And hopefully you're taking some screenshots. Unroll.me. I've been using it for years. It's very safe. Here's the thing. 
you're getting so much bulk email, spam email, Groupons, fashion alerts, and industry newsletters. And by the way, I happen to know some pretty good weekly and daily email newsletters you should be subscribing to, but they shouldn't be going into your primary work inbox. You go to enroll.me, put your email in, it's gonna churn away for a minute, and then it's gonna tell you how many bulk emails, subscription emails you're on. And I'll bet you it's 10 times more than you think. If you think you're on 10, you're on 100. If you think you're on 100, I literally was on 1,000. I'm not making that up. And then here's the beauty. With one button, you could unsubscribe to all of them. Or you could, it's a list, you could pick and choose. Yep, keep it, no, 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 keep it, no, keep it. And then hit the button and it will get rid of a bunch of them. Or let's say you're, you're just a madman and you're like, I want all 1,000 of these. You can have them put it into a digest. So you just get one email once a day or once a week that they all appear in. Wonderful. So you get that bulk email out. So how do I get to inbox zero? I'm still holding on to this big secret. You've got to remember the four Ds, the four Ds. So here's the thing, remember. Why would you wanna to get to inbox zero in the email? We just talked about the dangers of having a to-do list, right? Well, your email inbox right now, if I could look over your shoulder, I bet it's like a second to-do list, right? So someone says, hey, you know, Kevin, will you look at this report for me? Give me your feedback. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't have time to do that now. So I just close that window. It's still in my inbox and I've gotta go back to it when I have time and do it. And some of us, I don't know, I'd be curious in the comments, how many to-dos do you have sitting in your email inbox? One, five, 50? Like, I don't know. I mean, like how many, but it's like a second to-do list. 25, too many, a lot, over a hundred. Oh my gosh, over a hundred. That's a, a scare, 306. That's very specific, 306. Jennifer. <laughs> anyway, so here's the thing. You don't want to use a to-do list in your email inbox. So you touch emails once. You don't check emails, you process emails. You schedule time, you think about it intentionally. And then you open each email and you go through the four Ds. Oh, what is this? Can I just delete it? Good, boom, it's gone. Or you open the next one. Can I delete it? Nah, I can't delete it. Can I delegate it to somebody else? And that means forward, like can I just, um, so-and-so can do this instead, or I'll have my assistant do it, or it's for someone else. So that's your second D, either delete it or delegate it. If you can't delete it and you can't delegate it, then it's like, all right, do I do it now or do I defer it for later? I like a five minute rule. If I can do it, if I can respond to the person right then and there in less than five minutes, I just do it. But here's the secret. If it's gonna take me more than five minutes, I do not just leave it in my inbox. I turn it into a calendar event because I'm gonna live for my calendar. Now, many of you don't know, and again, I don't, I'm not your IT guy, I don't know what your email system looks like, but most of you don't realize, like this is one setup for Microsoft Outlook. You can drag an email onto the calendar and it will pop up a window and let you turn it into an appointment. This is another view of just dragging it onto the calendar icon. And now you can pick a day and a time to then finish whatever that email is, respond to that email. I use Google Calendar, it's a little, um, I use the web, the web version, so it's a little different, but it's like more and then event, for those of you who use Google Calendar, and you basically, anything that you can't do right then and there, you look at your calendar like, all right, I will do it tomorrow between 12 and 12.10, <laughs> or 12 and 12.15, whatever that is. And when you touch emails once, remember the four Ds, you're gonna end up with email zero um, very quickly. Now, this is a system that works for me. Try it on yourself or not, but like this is what I do. It's a system I call 3210. <clears throat> I, and I gotta change that. I say I check email three times a day. I don't like that word check, because that's like, ooh, I'm addicted. I'm constantly checking it. No, I process email three times a day. I, I'm like most of you, when I get into work, I'm getting ready, I wanna know what happened overnight. So I'm gonna process it a chunk in the morning. Then I need a break and I'm wondering what's going on in the morning. I process it around noon. And then before I go home at the end of the day, I wanna know what's going on in the afternoon. Do I need to put out any fires? So there's a third time towards the end of the workday. Two, one, I set my timer. I set my Google clock. You can use your phone for 21 minutes 
each time, 21, 21, 21. Why 21? Well, it was kind of cool, three, two, one, zero. But 21 minutes is about right. You know, it's about 15 minutes was too short, 30 minutes was too long. For me and my 300 emails a day, 21 minutes and having a timer, it's weird, but it's psychological. It's like a game. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, that looks like an interesting article. I'll click on that. And it's like, oh no, I've only got two minutes of the red dial left. I'll look at that later. I'll schedule it, right? So three, two, one, zero. Your goal is in each session to get as close to inbox zero as possible. I'm going to touch everything once. Can I delete it, delegate it, defer it, or do it? And look, not, you know, there's some days I'm not exactly zero, but you're going to be really close to zero. And really quickly, if your inbox is like got a thousand, you know, you've never cleared it out. Look, with our search technology now, you just got to clean it out. You, you declare email bankruptcy. And I just like archive them all, not delete, you archive them. You can get them back, you know, search by sender, search by date, search by keyword. You'll find it if you need it. But if it freaks you out to delete them or to archive them, just make a new folder called weird folder Kevin told me to create. And you just move all thousand of your inbox messages into that folder. If you need something, go open that folder and it's going to be there just like it is now. But you're going to be like, Ah, my inbox is zero. Let me try this three, two, one, zero thing. Giddy up. All right. Lime Tree, whoever that is, said 5,000 to inbox zero. I did it. Thank you, Cruz. Mind blowing. And then this is crazy. <clears throat> this is literally an email from today. So this is uh, someone over, over in the, the UK, Henry Stewart. Can I say a big thank you for transforming my work life? I adopted 3210 18 months ago. I've been less stressed, more productive. I reach zero at least once a day, despite checking the inbox less often. I'm more responsive to staff and clients. I get so much more done. Try it on like a coat. If you don't like it, take it off. All right, now I got a hustle. Secret number five, themes to batch work. This was what I heard a lot, is like people would just batch work over and over again. Jack Dorsey is the CEO of two publicly traded companies, for better or for worse, some might say. And he, you know, every day, like Monday, he just focuses on management. I do that to all my one-on-one -on -one meetings, my weekly one-on-ones, I stack them on Mondays. Tuesday, he focuses on product, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is how I live. Like, I try to theme each day. I create in the morning, I collaborate in the afternoon, I connect in the evening. So, for me, I try to schedule like my thinking work, my writing, my, create, my creative stuff, my cognitive work, my deep work in the morning. Collaborate, I'm collaborating with other people. That's phone calls, that's meetings, that's in the afternoon. And then at night, I try to connect with people. Like I'm gonna connect with my kids, I'm gonna connect with family members, connect with friends. Other people, it's simpler. They talk about maker time and manager time. My making time is in the morning and then my manage the business, manage my team all the administrative stuff gets managed in the afternoon. And secret six, because I want to go to questions. It's about energy, not time. Look, the only reason why I called my book has that time management phrase in it, it's because that's what people Google on. Like people think they need time management. We ain't getting any more minutes. We're not making more minutes. It's about managing our energy and our focus, right? Because look, if we have the flu or if we're hung over, imagine trying to do, read, you know, some textbook or write a really great speech or whatever it is you do and you're hung over and you've got the flu, like that hour, you're not going to get much done. But imagine, imagine you just had eight hours of sleep. You had a good strong cup of coffee. You know, it's nine o'clock in the morning or whatever your prime zone time is. Boom. You're going to bang out that speech, that article you're going to read. It's the same 60 minutes but it's our energy and focus that determines the output. That's how I got 36X from the first business to the last business. You know, evolutionarily speaking, biologically speaking, we're wired to um, react to changes in our environment, a loud noise, a light, you know, a flash of something. Is that a saber toothed tiger? Do I have to run? Is it going to eat me? Well, unfortunately, we don't have to worry about those things, but we're still like, you know, that's why I say mute your phone. Mute your phone. You want to maximize focused attention. The single best thing you can do to maintain focused attention throughout the workday is to work in kind of single focus. Don't multitask. That's a whole other topic. Single task working jam sessions where you're giving it your all and then taking a little break and then giving it your all and taking another little break. And so 
using something like the Google clock or your phone, you know, you would schedule, literally schedule these times. Now the question is how long should each work time be? How long should each break time be? The most popular system is the Pomodoro technique. So that people who do Pomodoros, it's 25 minute working jam session and a five minute break. By the way, five minute break is not email. It's stretch your legs, deep breaths, guzzle water, you know, move around a little bit, things that you're not really thinking. And then boom, you hit it again for 25 minutes. For me, that's not long enough. And in fact, one research study, software company, Draugin Group, whatever, I don't know how to pronounce it. They found their most productive people were 52 minutes on and 17 minutes off. Again, for me, 17 minutes off is kind of a long time to be off. I do 50 and 10. I give it all my all. I'm focused. My email is shut down. My phone is on airplane mode. I'm only doing one thing at a time for 50 minutes. And then boom, that alarm goes off. And now I'm up. I'm moving. I'm breathing. I'm drinking water, etc. Finally, the ultimate secret. Secret number seven. But in my book, it's number one. 1440. There's only 1,440 minutes in a day. No more, no less. The most successful people, they feel the value in these minutes. My life changed when I read this quote from Andy Grove, there's always more to be done, more that should be done, always more than can be done. All those people you know who are like very successful but they're always leaving the office at six o'clock or five o'clock every single day, they believe this. They're like, there's always gonna be more to, to do. There's always gonna be another deadline. There's always gonna be another fire to put out. There's always more ways I can make more money or climb, the, there's always gonna be more. I just have to think about when is enough and no judgment. Is it an eight hour day, a 10 hour day, a 16 hour day? You decide, but then you live to that standard. What can you do in a single minute? Deep cleansing breath or a yoga pose, you know, for your health. Uh, can you, you know, reach out to someone and say thank you? or I'm sorry, or I love you. You know, how long does it take to put your kids to bed at night? You know, for you to, you know, process some, some, some email. One minute counts. And when you really feel like the minutes are ticking away, 1440, your, your life will change. I used to have a 1440 sign uh, on my door to remind myself of this. And what I found is people would start to walk in, you know, got a minute? Oh yeah, sure. Hey, what's that 1440 in your door? It's about how important every single freaking minute is. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know what? Um, I'll just catch you on our one-on-one -on, -one on Monday because it's you know, Friday. I'll catch you on Monday. Out the door. All of a sudden, all those got in meetings went away. So readers of my book started putting 1440s out there. It's on, their, it's on their doors. It's on their computers. People send me these pictures. This one person wrote it. David Schultz wrote it in marker on his hand. And I know this is going to be weird. I now get pictures of people tattooing it on their body. I'm going to take this off because it's really hard to look at. <laughs> They're tattooing 1440, but that's the ultimate secret. If you know the value of a minute, what you can do with it, and that you're never getting it back, it's more valuable than money, all of a sudden your behaviors start to adapt. Hiran Doshi was, is the president of Omni Active Health, read my book, had me in, talked to his team, and he says, Kevin doubled my productivity. CEO doubled his productivity. His team left and I said, hey, here, and I said, that's nice of you to say that. I know you're just trying to motivate your team to like read the book and start doing this. He said, you know, how did it work for you? He says, well, you're right. I did lie to them. He says, I, I actually do the same amount of work I used to do, but now I finish it in two hours. I'm done by 10 a.m. He knew they wouldn't believe that. So he lied and said it only doubled his productivity. He's doing eight hours of work in two hours. He thinks the other six hours of the day and what he's already done in the first year was he realized he could get exponential growth with an acquisition strategy and they've now gone out and bought a couple companies and he said without doing this shrinking eight hours in a two, he never would have been able to stop and pause and think to get this quantum leap in results. So I'm going to go to questions, Vanya, and because I don't have a clock in my view, I know I'm running a little bit late, but I want to hang out here and try to get to as many as we can. And I got to tell you guys, so leadx.org, like if you want more of this, you know, we do a free course of the day every single day. A lot of times it's on leadership, management, sometimes it's on productivity. And the archive of this, of this session will be in the LeadX Academy. And, um, you know, it's, it's like for seven bucks a month, literally seven bucks a month, you get this training and me, like 20 different modules, just doing email, just doing meetings, 
all this kind of stuff. So, um, and it's like, hey, Vanya, it's like three days are free. They can check it all out for free, right? And then yeah, if they the want first, to sign up, they can do exactly. that. Exactly. The first three days are free. Just sign up for a free trial and you can uh, get the content you want. And if you want to cancel, you can cancel. Or you can uh, take a look around and see what else is there. We always have new content coming out. So. It, and this is, Van, you're going to kill me. And Jackie, my assistant, is going to kill me. So listen, you guys have been amazing with the comments. And I'm not going away. I'm going to answer some questions. But for any of you that actually sign up for the, the, subscri the annual subscription, seven bucks a month for all this training, like we'll look at all the email, all the signups we get for the next like three business days. So the end of day, well, let's say Wednesday, whatever date that is, the 25th. And I'll send you an autographed uh, copy of my book, the 15 secrets book. I'll pay for the shipping. I'll pay for the book. I'll sign it. And we'll send it to you as like a thank you gift. Cause like, this is really cool. You can tell I'm really hyped about it. So go check it out. You got three days to check it out for free. And then if you like it, subscribe and then I'll send you a book as well. Sounds good. Kevin, I'm so excited. We have so many good questions here. We've got questions coming in from Facebook. We've got questions from the chat. So you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Uh, so this first